Tex Rickard in 1919, looking over fight contracts signed by Jess Willard and challenger Jack Dempsey. On field near Toledo, he'll build wooden stadium to house coming fight for World's Heavyweight Boxing Championship. Former cowpuncher, Rickard quit Texas to join writer Rex Beach in fruitless search for Klondike gold. But here's a gold mine all his own. And here's one of two reasons crowds will jam Rickard's Toledo Stadium. It's giant Jess Willard in heavy sweater. Sure, he'll dump Dempsey in early round and retain his heavyweight crown. Jess is off to training camp where he looks like killer and in perfect condition for his July date with a strong but youthful kid from Manassa, Colorado. Determined to do his best on Independence Day, Dempsey plans to add win over Willard to his victory string. $60 top is high for times, but it's fights spectators could never forget. Dempsey knocks Willard down seven times in first round, and Willard was so battered by the end of third, his seconds threw in the towel. With Dempsey as his new attraction, Rickard draws million dollar gate to New Jersey area for Jack's fight with Carpentier of France. Jack wins, and Rickard goes on to new and greater glories at old Madison Square Garden on 23rd Street in New York City. Missouri-born Tex is long way from gold fields now, but silver tinkling at turnstiles is making him rich. But he's earning it by bringing good boxers into ring. New Madison Square Garden is setting for new era in boxing. Offering nearly half million dollar guarantee to Dempsey, Rickard signs Gene Tunney, newcomer against Jack in defense of his title. Fight gate is cool two million dollars, new high. For second Dempsey Tunney battle, with Tunney now defending title, Rickard moves into Chicago's Soldier's Field. On September 22, 1927, Dempsey fails to regain his crown, but gate of over $2,650,000 is highest in history, and Rickard is hailed as greatest sports promoter of all time. Yes, Rickard found his gold at a boxing arena's gate. But as all men must, on 6th of January, 1929, Tex Rickard dies. And it is fitting that the thousands who came to pay their last respects must come to Madison Square Garden. And as Rickard leaves the arena for the last time, those whom he helped to fame and fortune and who helped make him rich stand sadly by. The man from Missouri is no more. But what fond memories of him there must be in the mind of the morning Manasseh Mahler from that July in Toledo 10 years ago to this January day in 1929. Because for boxing and for Tex Rickard, it was a glorious road to riches. Everglades Avenue. It's May 1928, and crowds gather for ceremonies to mark opening up highway through Florida's heretofore nearly impassable Everglades. Barnes Hathaway, Florida State Road Commissioner, and publisher Baron G. Collier are joined by Thomas Alva Edison as historic ceremonies get underway. Highlight of affair is appearance of original trailblazers for great highway through Florida swamps, in 1928, a useful monument to man's genius as an engineer. In St. Paul, Minnesota, in 1925, here's latest thing in car care. In regular auto laundry, cars go from bath to shower and then get additional hosing down. of dirt roads could sure stick to those old-fashioned spoke wheels. Remember? Car laundries crop up in all major cities, and with crews constantly scrubbing and rubbing, Dusty Car came clean in one minute. 
Even women are among the workers to see that the rigs of the bumpy roads of 1925 got their baths. Here's former humorist George Ade at his Indiana home in the 1920s. Fables in Slang, written in 1899, is his best known book, but the golfing author wrote many successful books and plays and did some fine motion picture scenarios. Great name in American Hall of Wit and Humor, George Ade of Indiana and America. Mother of an even dozen children, here's Mrs. Lillian Gilbreth, long before she was named 1948's Woman of the Year. Famed as mother in true story, entitled Cheaper by the Dozen, Mrs. Gilbreth took over husband's work following his untimely death, one added fame of her own in 30s and 40s. Tennessee-born statesman Cordell Hull was congressman in 1920s, elected to Senate in 1931, but soon resigned to become Franklin Roosevelt's first Secretary of State. Author of federal income tax law, he was member of Lower House as early as 1907, served nearly 20 sessions on House Ways and Means Committee. Cordell Hull. Big wind whips through North Minneapolis, Minnesota and leaves corridor of confusion in its wake. Homes are ripped open as struck by gigantic cleaver. Walls of sturdier buildings are crumbled by tornado's force. Still dazed victims search ruins for missing persons and what's left of personal belongings. Fire adds to havoc and horror which devours wreckage scattered through the area. Damaged homes are totally destroyed by the fury of raging fire that followed roaring wind. It's 1927, and outside Sly Pryor Accordion School, its largest orchestra of its kind, and has members of all sizes, ages, and ability. What's more, its repertoire includes the hot jazz music of the era and even an accordionist who's really on the ball. Good old 1927. Search for safety. At Mitchell Field, Long Island, 12 planes assemble for 1929 Guggenheim Prize. There's a award of $150,000 for plane maker demonstrating best device for advance of safety in the air. This entrance shows new way to get around stormy weather, I guess. But most contestants show latest mechanical improvement for quick takeoffs, steep climbs, and short landing runs. So far, looks as if this pilot is at controls of a winner, but there are other planes to come. Here's Schroeder Wentworth entry, flying high for that 150,000. And here's what weird craft looks like. And this is 20 years before first talk of flying saucers. This entry is after prize for new departure in construction of its wings. And speaking of wings, watch what happens when this plane engineer gets through showing his pilot what to do. Wonder which direction it flew. Fabulous flapper. In the days of the It Girl and Clara Bow, champagne from slippers and first fling of tabloid newspapers, the flapper was America's shining example of womanhood. Free at last, she not only dressed freely, but was lavish with makeup, chewed gum, and even smoked in public. No one even gives these things a thought today, but in the early 1920s, these girls were devilish and daring. Were they, though? Stroking through broad waters of Catalina Channel is Mrs. Martha T. Huddleston, contestant in 1927 Wrigley Swim. 
Far ahead of her is eventual winner, Canada's George Young. But the sturdy Mrs. Huddleston has a first all her own. She's first woman to swim waters between Catalina Island and California coast. And with money she wins, she's going to send this young son of hers to college. Her time, 20 hours, 42 minutes, some swim. From prison to professional ball, it's early in the 1930s. And in yard of new Sing Sing prison, the band marches and the stands are filled with inmates. And then Holy Name kicks off to Sing Sing. It's big boner, but it's start of beautiful game. For in Sing Sing backfield is Edwin C. Pitts, in for robbery, but out to make a name for himself as Sing Sing's greatest athlete. Yes, you're watching Alabama Pitts. Plow, pass, and plunge Sing Sing to a six touchdown win over Holy Name and himself to a 1935 pardon. In September of that year, he signed to play football with the Philadelphia Eagles of the National Professional Football League, then went south again in 36 to play baseball for the Charlotte Club of the Carolina League. Alabama Pitts goes over for a score and then right over the wall. Thank you. 